Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to First United Methodist Church of Crockett, Texas. I'm Pastor Michael Bedevian, and it is a delight and a joy for me to welcome all of you here today, and those of you watching on Facebook live stream and listening on KIBY Radio. Thank you for tuning in and being present with us in our worship today. I hope that those who are in our sanctuary this morning will take a moment to register your attendance, as well as those who are watching on Facebook will let us know of your presence. Check in with us if you can. I do have a few announcements to add to this morning's uh, before we get started. Our new member orientation class will be at 4 p.m in the Questers classroom, uh, although there might be some changes about that, moving it to the conference room upstairs in the office building. But go to the Questers classroom if you're a new member wanting to attend that class. And uh, if, if there's a sign on the door instructing you to come upstairs here, then that's where we'll be. See me after the uh, service if that's confusing for you. I'm sorry for that. Also, please be mindful that October the 2nd is our church conference, our church leadership, our budget, our affiliation with the United Methodist Church will be voted on at this very important meeting, and I hope all of our members will make every effort to attend. There are some extra materials that were handed out. If you didn't get them when you came in regarding that uh, conference, I hope you'll pick them up on the way out if you did not get them on the way in. I also understand that we have a blood drive today taking place in the fellowship hall immediately after this service. If you would like to give blood, by all means, uh, please report over to the fellowship hall. You do not have to have an appointment. I'd also like to briefly mention, as Chris did last week, that on October 5th in the FLC, the Education Committee is planning a return to family game night. It's going to be a very exciting, and you may get to hear a little bit more about it next week, but put October 5th. Wednesday on your calendar, it'll be 6.30 p.m. We won't feed you dinner, but we'll give you dessert. Uh, so please come and be a part of that. This concludes our announcements. There are other uh, items on the back of the bulletin I hope you'll be mindful of. So let's go ahead and get started with our worship. Will you join with me in our call to worship as printed in your bulletin? Like a whisper that lures us to safety. Strong as a shout that lures us to come. Gentle as a prayer that eases our worry, like a clear bell that rings out our hand. Your word comes to us, loving God. It calls us, comforts us, and urges us to depart from evil and do good, to seek peace and pursue it. Talking God, open our hearts to hear you and free our voices to praise you. Let us free our voices indeed by standing together as you're able and singing our opening hymn. Number 103, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. We'll sing verse 1, 3, and 4. <laughs>
please join me in the affirmation of faith. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is one true church, apostolic and universal, for whose holy faith lets us now declare, we believe in God the Father, infinite in wisdom, power and love, whose mercy is all his works, and who is directed his children's good. We believe in Jesus Christ, Son of God and Son of Man, the gift of the Father's and Father's grace, the ground of our hope, and promise of our deliverance from sin and death. We believe in the Holy Spirit as a divine presence in our lives, whereby we are kept in spiritual remembrance of the truth of Christ and find strength and help in time of need. We believe that this faith should manifest itself in service of love as set forth an example of the blessed Lord to the end that the kingdom of God may come upon the earth. Amen. with you that you might be up to date on the most recent prayers. I'm going to begin with the most recent injury and I apologize for my pronunciation. Hemi. Uh, Daham, Hemi's son, broke his collarbone on the playground uh, in Nacogdoches this weekend. And we want to keep him in our prayers as he recuperates from that difficult injury. We want to remember Matthew Johnson, who was at Whitehall going through rehab. We want to remember Brandy Rea. She is our church custodian. Let us remember her and her family because her mother died in a terrible car accident Friday night. A terrible, unexpected loss. We think she had a medical event while she was driving, thus causing the wreck. So, Brandy Rea, our custodian mother. And this morning, we celebrate the beautiful blessing of Kyle and Wendy LeBeau's new baby girl, Esme Ann LeBeau, born Thursday. We're delighted about that. And I understand there's going to be a baby shower for her in the FLC after this service. Um, so at any rate, um, it's going to be a great event for her. She's never had a baby shower before. And uh, she was so touched and has been touched by this congregation's love reaching out to her. So do know um, they do appreciate us very much. Please keep these and all of those other prayer requests that are listed in the bulletin on your hearts and in your prayers over the coming week. Let's join together now as one body and pray. Father God, we come into your presence this morning so grateful for the grace you've poured into our lives. We're amazed that you, we would matter so much to you you created a world, Lord God, that inspires and delights every one of our senses, but it also challenges us. You ask us to be holy because you are holy. And you've established a covenant of grace in which we can thrive with the help of your Spirit. Your word tells us that you've called us into a royal priesthood and given us a share in the work that you are doing. Lord God, your love has given our lives eternal meaning and significance 
far beyond anything we could ever secure for ourselves. We thank you, Father. Lord God, today we're mindful of loved ones and friends who are struggling with very difficult challenges. Some are struggling with their health. They face illness, physical challenges that are often painful and terribly difficult to endure. We're mindful of those dear to us who have lost loved ones and are struggling with a separation and loneliness. Lord God, the thought of losing the blessing of their fellowship grieves our heart in ways we can't bear to think about. Lord God, these and so many other needs we bring before you from our hearts because we know only your healing touch can bring restoration. Only your calming presence can bring peace and comfort into our lives. So hear our prayers, Father, as we remember our loved ones and friends this morning. And let your spirit bring healing. Lord God, sometimes we're so overwhelmed by the day-to-day -day events in our lives, we often forget to call out to you, thinking that we can overcome a crisis all by ourselves. It seems no matter how hard we try to do it ourselves, the storms just seem to get bigger and we're more frustrated and feeling lost. But you do not give us a spirit of timidity or fear, Lord God. Help us to be more aware that you're always there and are ready to help lift us up out of our storm as it rages around us. You are truly faithful and compassionate. Endow us, Lord God, with the wisdom to trust you and give our storms over to you. Father, help us to always remember that you are constantly present and that you're bigger than any storm that might encompass our lives. Everything we've lifted up this morning and those personal things intimate to our hearts, we share with you in the name of our Savior who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. to invite the children to come forward because Jolene has another amazing message for you right over there. Good morning. Good to see you all this morning. Now, next Sunday, if you have looked at your calendar, it's going to be the first Sunday in October. And always on the first Sunday of the month, what do we do? Communion. We do communion. That's right. But next Sunday's communion is going to be really special because all of the people in the United Methodist Church all over the world and some other denominations also will be uh, celebrating worldwide communion. Can you imagine all the children that are in part of the United Methodist Church all over the world having communion on the very same day? That's really special, isn't it? Now, uh, this call to having one special day of communion has been, uh, was put forth back in about 1940, but it became part of the Methodist discipline 
when it was voted in 1972 to insert it in the Book of Discipline so that uh, it shows the unity of people through Christ and the call for the church to reach out to all people and model diversity among God's children. Now, this uh, special Worldwide Communion Sunday has a special offering. The money that's left up here at the altar rail is given to people who are going into the ministry. It helps fund their education to become a minister. So it, next Sunday, when you come take communion, think about how many people all over the world are taking communion. Now, you may have noticed that when communion is over, sometimes we have bread and we have juice left over. What happens to that leftover bread and juice? All right. Notice that nothing gets thrown away, does it? They don't take a trash can and dump the bread and dump the juice because it has been blessed. And so being blessed, we don't want to turn it into trash. So one of two things can happen. Either it is consumed, and I've seen uh, uh, children come to the, uh, the rail and consume the leftover juice, or it can be placed out in the garden where it returns to the earth or is possibly eaten by the animals that are in the garden. So it becomes part of the world itself. Now, uh, we consider being Christians as being lifesavers. That's right. If you're a Christian, we believe you are uh, uh, saved, and uh, the bread and the uh, juice that we consumed are part of the life-saving process. So today, your activity looks like this. It says, for our so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Excellent reading, wouldn't you say? beautiful John 3 16 so in your packet you will find uh, the materials to make yourself this and you will also find some lifesavers thank you for coming Jolene, you always give out some of the best stuff at children's messages. I keep forgetting to come. <laughs> okay, she did a good job. <laughs> yes, she did. I'd like to invite our ushers to come forward so we may now present to God his tithes and our gifts.
Try the doxology. It's next, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs>
Please stand as you are able for the reading from today's scripture from Luke chapter 17, verses 22 through 33. Then he said to the disciples, The day will come when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. And they will say to you, Look here or look there. Do not go after them or follow them. For as the lighting that flashes out of one part under heaven shines to the other part under heaven, so also will the Son of Man will be in his day. But first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. And as it was in the days of Noah, it will also be in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives, and they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went to Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. So it will be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day, he who is on top of the, on the housetop and his goods are in the house, let him not come down to take them away. And likewise, the one who was in the field, let him not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Will you please be seated? And will you join me in a word of prayer? God, our Heavenly Father, it is my prayer that you will hide me behind the cross of Christ. And I pray that just as Jesus was pierced for our transgressions, our hearts and our minds will be pierced with the truth and the authority of your word to draw us in an ever closer walk with you. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. If you delve into this passage and look more at its context, a few verses before, you'll notice that uh, this passage comes from a conversation that began with the Pharisees questioning Jesus. And they were inquiring about when the kingdom of God would come. Now, I don't know if I find it more sad or more disturbing that these so-called experts and teachers of the law were questioning Jesus, the very one, the only one who fulfilled the law, the very word of God made flesh. The audacity of it blows my mind. Fact-checking Jesus, really? But they were always trying to trap him. Well, Jesus gave his answer, finishing his response by cautioning his listeners with the following words. He said, whoever seeks to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. Looking closely within his answer, we see how Jesus referred to two historical moments within the Old Testament to make his point. He wanted to help his listeners understand the truth by giving them a history lesson. He spoke about Noah and Lot. So this morning, I'd like to focus on Lot's story. He was a son of Haran, Abram's brother and the grandson of Terah. When Lot's father died, his uncle Abram took him into his house. Now this was before Abram moved to Canaan. So Lot is living with Abram. And I'm sure Abram was glad to do that because of the fact that Abram's wife, Sarah, couldn't have children at that particular time yet. So Lot, you might say, became the son of Abram and Sarah couldn't have. Abram taught Lot everything he knew. He taught him how to farm. He taught him about God. He taught him by example what it meant to obey God no matter what. I have no doubt about that. And that lesson was no more clearly taught than when God told Abram to leave his homeland, the place where they had lived for years and years, and go to an unnamed land, a land that God would show them. It was I shared several weeks ago. When I take a trip, I want to know exactly how I'm going to get there and where I'm going. But Abram, stepping out in faith in the presence of his family, was willing to, to go to a place God would reveal to him in time. So Abram went 
And he took Lot with him and his whole family. And they set out for the land of Canaan. They eventually settled in Bethel for a while. And Abram built an altar there. And then they continued their journey. But a famine arose in the land. And Abram and his family moved to Egypt. Well, it was actually a common occurrence in that day for the people of Palestine and Syria to go to Egypt during times of famine. There was usually more food there. And so that's what Abram and his family did. And they stayed in Egypt during the famine, but were eventually forced to leave because of some funny business that took place between the Pharaoh and Sarah and Abraham. <laughs> but we'll leave that for another sermon. So they all left Egypt and found their way back to Bethel where Abram had built the altar, altar some years earlier. Now by this time, Abram had become a very wealthy man, rich in livestock and possessions. And his nephew Lot, who had learned his craft from his uncle Abram, has proper, prospered as well. So much so that the Bible says in Genesis 13, their possessions were so great that they couldn't live together. And there was strife between the herders of Abram's livestock and the herders of Lot's livestock. So Abram called Lot to him and they struck a deal. As hard as it must have been for him to do this, because Lot was important to him, Abram said this, Now I don't want there to be any trouble between us. After all, we're family. So we're going to have to go our separate ways. You go wherever you want to go, and if you go left, I'll go right. If you go right, then I'll go left. And so here's Lot. It's the opportunity of a lifetime. He gets first choice. He has all the cards in his hand, and he can play them any way he wants. And so he looks one way, and he sees land as far as the eye can see, and he looks the other way and toward the fertile plain of the Jordan, and he saw land so fertile that it looked to him like the Garden of Eden, probably. And he noticed cities there. Cities that were filled with all kinds of people and opportunity. I don't know what he was thinking. Maybe he thought, well, I, I can go one way and spend the rest of my life as a farmer. Or I've got money and I've got abilities that I learned from my uncle. And I'm ready for a change. And what's more, I've heard about Sodom. I've heard about the endless, light, the endless nightlife. I've heard about all the fun a person can have there. And so the Bible says Abram settled in the land of Canaan and Lot chose to move to Sodom. He settled there among the cities of the plain and moved his tent there. But can you blame him? I mean, he had a choice to make. And so I imagine Lot, he was enticed by the city lights off in the distance. Wasn't out in the desert anymore. And I think probably there's something in all of us that, that is drawn to such things. And the city of Sodom probably had it all. It, it was a city that was filled with energy and excitement. I mean, it was probably the kind of city that, that came alive when the sun went down. But while it may have looked like an incredible place to live, its beauty was only found on the surface. In Genesis 13, 13, the Bible says that the people of Sodom were wicked, great sinners against the Lord. Now, I think that's putting it mildly. I mean, it was such a raucous place that Jerry Springer could have taken a lifetime of shows in Sodom. <laughs> but it was to Sodom that Lot was attracted. And it was to Sodom that he went. And sometimes people make decisions like that because it just seems the right thing to do. Well, the Bible says in Proverbs 14, 12, there is a way that seems right to a person, but it and as a way that leads to death. Little did Lot know that those words would eventually come true for a lot of people. Well, Lot raised his family there in Sodom. He became a man of influence. He, he was one of those persons who sat at the city gates, shook a lot of hands, made a lot of friends. Very political kind of guy. So you might say that Lot's family just fell in love with the city. They became a part of Sodom, but fortunately Sodom became a part of them. And yet I wonder if on those nights 
when he would sit at the city gates, hearing the laughter and the screams and seeing the dancing and the fighting and the drunkenness and the debauchery. I wonder if in the back of Lot's mind, he wondered what life might have been like if he had chose a different direction when he and his uncle were together making that decision. I mean, he learned about following God from his uncle Abe. He spent the better part of his life watching and listening to a man who was probably about as close to the heart of God as a person could be. And now he found himself in a city where God was not even, even a second thought in the minds of the people. And unfortunately, as is the case with many folk, he'd gotten sucked into the culture that was all around him. Well, as the story goes, two angels visited Sodom one evening. You may remember how Abram had bargained with God a few chapters earlier in Genesis to save Sodom. So the Lord agreed with Abram, if it were confirmed, that if there were at least ten righteous souls in Sodom, the city would be spared. So these angels, their, their intention was to, to witness and confirm that Sodom was as wicked of a town that God was saying. If so, then they were going to destroy the place. Well, they walked up to the city gates and Lot was sitting there. And somehow Lot was, he saw clearly through a, a, maybe a discernment or some special vision that was all too often blurred by the ways of Sodom. He, somehow he recognized that these two men were of God. And something compelled them to talk to these men and say, hey, don't go into the city. Just stay at my house. You can spend the night there, and, and then you can go on your way tomorrow. Just don't go in the city. And while they intended to spend the night in the town square, they agreed to stay the night with Lot. And well, let's just say that it wasn't a very good night. Because before they had gone to bed, the men of the city gathered outside the doors of Lot's house and they called out to Lot and they said, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Send them out to us so that we can have our way with them. But Lot said, and, and, and I still can't believe he said this. But it sort of gives you an idea of how deeply he had become absorbed into the culture. He said to these men outside the house, I don't want to send these men to you, but I have two daughters. You can take them. Well, they didn't want any of that. They wanted Lot's visitors. And so they kept pressuring Lot and started to break down the door of Lot's house. But the men inside Lot's house then reached out and pulled Lot back inside and they struck the men who were outside with blindness so that they couldn't find the door. And that's all these two visitors needed to make their decision about whether or not to destroy the city. It was now inevitable. inevitable. And so they said to Lot, if you have anyone else here in Sodom, sons-in-laws, son daughters, you better get them out of the city because God has sent us here to destroy Sodom. Now, I, there's one more thing I don't understand about this. How, how, after, after what Lot said that night, how he could have been counted among those who were safe in the city's destruction. Remember, he said, just take my daughters. But i got to remember that off in the distance, over in Canaan, his uncle Abraham was most certainly praying for Lot's deliverance. Do you think prayer doesn't work? It sure did there. And so Lot did go to his sons-in-laws who were pledged to marry his daughters about what the angel had told him. And he told them that they had just a little bit of time left to leave. They needed to get ready to go. And what did they do? They laughed at him. And when morning was about to break, the angel told Lot, it's time. You better hurry. 
Take your wife and your daughters and get out of here, or else you'll be swept away when the city is punished. And then in Genesis 19, verse 16, there are a few more words that, that I just haven't been able to turn off in my mind. Lot had been warned by these angels. He'd been told there wasn't any time left. He needed to get out of town. It was about to be destroyed. It's like you and I hearing over the news that a, that a, that a nuclear warhead is coming our way. It could be happening in the next 30 minutes or the next hour. We needed to run for shelter and safety. Get into our shelters down below ground. Whatever we can do. Lot was warned. Now, do it. But verse 16 says, And while he lingered, I want to let those words sink in for a minute. He lingered. I guess what I just can't get out of my mind is that we do the very same thing sometimes. God's authoritative word teaches us to go a certain direction in our lives. We know we, we need to leave behind a particular way of life. We know because the Bible teaches us what is wrong in the eyes of God. We know the danger and we know the consequences. We've heard that Jesus said, you don't know the day or the hour that I'll return, so be ready, always be ready. And you know, and I know in our heart of hearts that today could be the very last day of our life. I mean, we could die tomorrow, and maybe, maybe we know we're not living the kind of life God wants us to live. I mean, we've, we've all been like that. And yet, knowing all we know, we sometimes linger. We just stand there knowing where we need to go, where we need to leave behind, that there's an urgency to it, but a part of us is still holding on to where we want to go. And there are a lot of reasons we linger. For some, it's fear that causes us to linger. We're so used to life as it is, like a lot, we've grown comfortable with the lives we've built. We like our positions, our status. We don't want to lose it. The very thought of change is uncomfortable. And you and I both know that if you turn your life loose and give it to God, I mean, you really give it to God and surrender yourself to his authority, there's going to be some radical change. And for some of us, that's a frightening proposition. Now, for others of us, we linger because we love the way our lives are. We want them to be that way. We, we don't want to change. It's not about fear. It's about desire. You might think that if you get too close to Jesus and you might feel compelled to give more of your money to his cause or that you might have to let go of the grudge that you've been carrying on another person or that you might end up feeling guilty about some of the things you do when you're with your friends. Like the rich young ruler who loved his stuff so much, so much more than Jesus he just couldn't let go. Some of us might fit in that category, and so we linger. And for more of us than would care to admit, it's our ego that causes us to linger. We just aren't too comfortable with this whole authority of God's word thing. I mean, let's face it, we can be a self-centered people. We like to think we have all the answers. We like to think we know all we need to know. And the most difficult decision many of us have ever made is to let go of our inflated idea of ourselves and obey God. Thank God the angels grabbed Lot by the hand and practically dragged him out of town. 
Of course, he did bargain with them to let him go to a little village near Sodom instead of going far away into the hills. He just couldn't get too far away from Sodom. The place was special to him. And you remember what happened, right? The angels told him to go, and I'll look back. Well, they probably knew he was a lingering kind of guy. Well, Lot's wife looked back and she died. So I gotta say this, you think, you think your actions or your beliefs, your attitudes just affect you? You are wrong. The way you practice your faith, the way you live your life, your attitudes, your behavior, they affect the attitudes and behavior and faith expressions of your spouse and your children, even your friends. Lot's wife looked back because she learned to linger in the midst of evil from her husband. It's a contagious thing, you know. As humans, we have the tendency to allow the world's corrupt ideas to creep into our own lives a little at a time. Until before you know it, we're reflecting more of the world's ideas than we're reflecting the image of God. And this is what happened to Israel many times throughout their history until they had to go on exile. They discounted and belittled the authority of God. And don't fool yourself to deny that we've seen it happen in our generation as well. And so I just simply want to say this. Christians need to live lives that communicate our testimony. Lives that tell the story of our faith. Lives that reflect our belief in the authority of Jesus Christ. We need to try and live lives that will reflect God's image. And actually we ought to be doing that without even thinking about it. Believe it or not, people should know that you are a Christian. At least I hope that you're not so embarrassed about Jesus that you would try to hide it. People should see undeniable testimony that you're a Christian through your actions and through your words, through your obedience to his word. So what kind of testimony are you giving with your life? Do people see in you a cheap God? Do people see a God who just doesn't care one iota about whatever decision you make good with him? Is that what people see? People see a God who only makes a good first impression. Do people see a God who comes and goes like the wind? What's it going to be for you? Are you willing to take the kind of leap into a God-honoring, Jesus-following life that communicates the testimony of a person who's completely sold out to Jesus. Or will you linger just a little longer? Remember, Whoever seeks to save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for Christ's sake will preserve it. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. This morning I would invite any person who is wanting to become a member of this church through transfer of membership from another United Methodist church or profession of faith or transfer from another denomination as we stand together and sing, I invite those persons to come forward. We'll be singing To God Be the Glory, number 98, in your hymnal. Please stand and please come.
on the way to Shiloh this morning, Robbie looked at me and he said, Michael, I'm going to do it today. I'm going to join your church. And I said, well, Robbie, you know you're going to have to take that class. He said, yes, sir, I do. So I'm going to introduce Robbie Belk, our interim music director, <laughs> soon to be music director, I believe, uh, to come forward here. Robbie, uh, we are delighted to, uh, to uh, welcome you uh, into the church. Uh, after you complete that class, we're honored that you would want to be a part of our congregation. I do have to ask you this one question that we ask all persons, even if they're coming from the Methodist Church or Baptist or whatever. Um, uh, if they're already profession, profess their faith, we always ask this question. Uh, will you be loyal to the United Methodist Church and will you promise to support it with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, service, and witness? Very good. Now, since Robbie is going to be going to that class, we, we assume he is. <laughs> uh, I do want us as a congregation to affirm his eventual joining of our church. And so let me invite you to stand and let us share with Robbie our affirmation of his joining. We rejoice to recognize you as members of Christ's Holy Church and bid you welcome to this congregation of the United Methodist Church. With you, we renew our vows to uphold it with our prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness. Amen. Well, we welcome you to our church. Do we not, congregation? We're glad to have you, sir. And I will be seeing you at 4 o'clock. Yes, sir. All right. Oh, let us, let us have the benediction. And now may the peace of God which surpasses all human understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, both now and forevermore. Amen. Thank mm -hmm. you.